We're talking Star Trek, comic book dream teams, and who is the scariest character ever? Because your geek history lesson, Mailbag, is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason. Who doesn't love stamps? Inman. Welcome to the Mind University. This is Geek History Lesson, the podcast where we take one character, one construct, one book, and teach you everything you need to know about it in a little bit less than an hour. Unless it's an episode like today, which is a mailbag episode. That's right. We have reached out to you, the listeners, you, the patrons who support the podcast, and you, the people who barely tolerate us on Twitter, <laughs> to give us questions. And um, this is this is something new we started this year. And to be honest with you, every time we open up the mailbag, we get more and more questions. Um, so, Ashley, we've been doing these about once a quarter. I, I think these are going to keep going on. We've had a lot of success with the GHL mailbag. I definitely think so. I'm really enjoying doing them, and I'm enjoying getting our listeners to literally – become a part of the show with us. Yes, that is correct. Uh, I really dig it. So um, real quick, we should uh, shout out all the places for a future mailbag. Um, if you are looking to, we always put those announcements out. Patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, is where you can support Geek History Lesson. Um, you know, it's, it supports all our various different podcasts. There's five Patreon exclusive podcasts a month. There could be a sixth very soon. And we get paid, we get priority to mm -hmm. our patrons. Mm -hmm. There also is, you can send us questions on our Facebook and our Twitter. Ashley, where are those? Facebook.com slash Geek History Lesson or on Twitter at GHL Podcast. Yeah, so go follow all those places because the next time we do one of these mailbags, that is where you're going to see the little post go up. Put all these questions. That's what these people did. Exactly. And they do go up on Patreon before they go up anywhere else. Uh, patrons do get first crack at this. And I just want to say that if you do ask a question and we don't answer it, it's not because we don't like you. It's certainly not because we don't like your question. Sometimes the questions you guys give us, guys, gals, non-binary pals, are literally too good. They are too complicated for us to give a short, maybe five minute answer on. So yes. we have parked them for maybe another time, maybe a full lesson. Sometimes it's a topic that someone's already asked a question about. Sometimes, uh, as happened this month, it's a topic that we did a whole Jason and Ashley's Excellent Adventure about. Yeah, so, go check that out on the Patreon. Yeah, yeah, so please don't have your feelings hurt if we didn't ask your question. Please we, continue to ask questions because we appreciate all of you joining us We here. obviously cannot answer them all. No, because there's we get about 60 questions for each of these episodes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, dive in, Ashley. Uh, let's kick us off. All righty, first question from Tom Trainer on Patreon. Hello, and Tom. Tom asks, what's one retcon in the history of either of the big two that you would remove if you could and why? Okay, so first off, uh, Ashley, I think we should tease. This sort of ties into an episode we got coming up pretty soon. Uh, true, true and scientific facts. Do we want to just go ahead and give that away? Let's do it. So we have a requested episode coming up very soon, which is the best, I'm going to, uh, this might not be the exact title, but this is the subject yeah, matter, yeah. Uh, is best reboots in comics, best comic book reboots. Uh, so we're actually going to be diving super deep into this topic and we have a really cool guest returning to Geek History Lesson to join us for that episode. We do. We do. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about best comic reboots. This is hard. Um, I don't think that there is a retcon. And, of course, when he's talking about the big two, he's talking about Marvel Comics and DC Comics. Um, I don't know if there's one that jumps out to me. Is there one that jumps out to you? My hot take on this is all of them. All, all of them? Because I... I really like the Grant Morrison approach, and we talk about this a lot, especially when we talk about Legion characters or Donna Troy or characters who have had a ton of retcons and reboots over the years. I have embraced the idea that it all happened. All of it is in canon. All of it is valuable. And I, as the fan, am the one sort of stuck building our timeline, which is why we started doing these timeline episodes. The Superman one just came out with Jason and making Cameron Cuff. Making your own continuity, which we have as a t-shirt over on T Public. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my my initial reaction is to be like, well, get rid of all the retcons because all of it counts. Nah. However, 
Crisis on Infinite Earth is iconic. There's a lot of really important ones. So that's the one you'd remove. No, 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 no. Oh. But I mean, like, <laughs> I love Crisis. So if I'm going to say we'll get rid of all of them, I mean, there's ones that I think have been more or less effective, and we'll go into that on the episode. But that's a hard question. Uh, I don't know which one I would remove. There's not necessarily one that jumps out to me. So Tom. Thank you for asking a complicated question. We're putting a pin in it. We will answer it for about an hour in a couple weeks. Well, you know, <laughs> well, I, hmm. What's one retcon? Man, um, this is a tough one, Tom. I'm going to say a controversial one. Uh huh. Red Hood. You would get, it's the only interesting thing about Jason Todd. <laughs> I. <laughs> You know what? I'm, I didn't say Damian Wayne to protect your feelings. Well, Damian Wayne's not a retcon. Well, uh, Batman impregnating Talia is a retcon. Uh, sort of. Sort of. Yeah, and yeah, sort of. Because sort of it not. happened thirty years ago. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna say redhead it's because fine, I want. I wanted literally everybody in their car to be like, "What?" <laughs> um, I'm gonna say Red Hood because. I sometimes lean towards like Superman where Superman should be the only Kryptonian. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I do feel the Bat family is too big. It definitely is too big. And especially since we're now 20 years post Jason Todd coming back now, uh -huh. or 15 years. I don't know what the exact the timeline, but um, I don't feel they've done enough with him. Like when he first showed up, it was super interesting. You were like, yeah, but now he's just sort of like sort of sometimes a good guy sort of sometimes a bad guy. And to me, I'm like, no, no, no. Either he should be the, he should redeem himself and become an ultimate superhero. He should be a bad guy. I lean towards, he should be the the most badass yep. supervillain of the DC universe. When that event happened recently, Leviathan, mm -hmm. and the big mystery was like, who was Leviathan? And he pulled off his mask and he found out that it was 1970s Manhunter who nobody, there was a reason why that series was canceled. Yeah. Um, it kind of, the reaction online was kind of, that's it. Mm -hmm. Or in one of the earlier issues, they hinted that it was Jason Todd because the character also wore a red hood. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. was like, that is genius because of course Batman would create the DC universe's greatest supervillain. I mean, if not the DC universe's greatest supervillain, he should definitely be the Bat family's greatest supervillain because he understands how they were. Yeah. And then it's interesting because in We Are Robin and Robin Wars, they set up this bond between him and Tim. And to me, that's more interesting if... Tim is a member of the Bat family. Jason is working against them, but they still share this brotherly yep. companionship. But uh, that's not a perfect answer. But uh, Tom, your question was so great that I couldn't come up with something right off the top of my head. So. There you go. All right. The next question we have is from Lee Carter. If a comic book or graphic novel was made about your life, who would be your personal dream team of writer and artist to bring your story to comic book shelves everywhere? Mm. Ashley. My dream team would be written by Jason Inman. <laughs> what? Because nobody knows me better than you. And I think, I, I genuinely think you're a great writer. Oh, thank besides you. being my partner, I think you're amazing. Uh, art by Nicholas Scott. Ooh. Colors by Jordi Belair. Letters by Chris Iliopoulos. Uh, and edited by Joe Illich. That would be my ideal uh, production team. Wow, you went full. On the I, I didn't Violet. even. Oh, boy. I just truly picked all my favorite people. <laughs> <laughs> who work in those mediums. <laughs> like the way I build my teams on these episodes. All right, all right. Uh, published by First Second, because... Oh I'm not going that they're far. They're iconic. <laughs> uh, f I'm going to say Jeff Lemire. Ooh, you do love Jeff I Lemire. I do like Jeff Lemire, and he knows about writing about uh, sad boys in small towns. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> for art, I'm going to say one of my favorites, Howard Porter. Mm, I love Howard Porter. And that's as far as I'm going. Uh, but I will say letters, letters by Taylor Esposito. There you go. Letter of <laughs> Jupiter Jet. Letter of Jupiter And also Red Hood. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and Red Hood and the Outlaws. Yeah. <laughs> We're tying it in, everybody. Every question is going to be tied in somehow. There you go. <laughs> Our next question comes from Zachary Parkerson, who says, how do we get y'all to teach us more about Star Trek? I've just entered this world with the next generation and must learn more. I'm so intrigued. Guide me, captains. Um, we my, have several Star my Trek first, episodes. My first answer is Google. Uh, <laughs> Zachary, you're lovely. I'm not making fun of you, but we do have several we have several episodes on Star Trek. We released one this year with John Champion when Picard came out. Um, also, if you haven't watched our 31 episode miniseries, the uh, Red Shirt Diaries, that's a lot of Trek that you can get from us. But we are always game to chat more Trek, right, Jason? 
Yeah. I'm certain. I'm certain there will be more Trek episodes in the future. Yes. Uh, the problem right now, as I'm sure many listeners know, is we don't know when anything's coming out. Yep. So we're doing our best. But uh, if you want more Trek from us, I think we are happy, happy to oblige, my friend. Now, this next patron has a difficult name for me to pronounce, but I'm going to try my best and apologize right now. Uh, I don't Yusin. Is that right? I always assumed it was a play on I don't get it. So I always thought it was I don't get it. Oh, it might be I don't, I don't get know. it. You I'm sorry, sweet man. Is it could you be? Is comment it? on many of our Patreon posts. You're absolutely love. I'm sorry. We don't know how to say your name. Jason and I are Anglophones and yes. we do our best. <laughs> uh, but that's a great question. If you could bring back one superhero cartoon that ended too soon, what would it be and how would you wrap it up? I have an answer for this right out the gate. Okay. I am not going to be as arrogant to pitch anything to wrap it up because I know that the people that make this cartoon are way smarter and more creative than me. I would bring back Green Lantern. The I knew you series. were going to say that. Green yeah, yeah. Lantern, the animated series, the Bruce Tim. Uh, he has loosely said that it is in the continuity of his DC universe. It's drawn in his style. It's 3D animated. It didn't get any love because of the terrible Green Lantern movie mm -hmm. that came out the year before. But Green Lantern, the animated series is as good as the rest of the Bruce Tim animated cartoons. It is just a solid and it ends on a cliffhanger and Definitely needs a third season. That's my pick. That is a really, really good pick. And how would it end? Ah, Blackest Night. I don't know. Uh, Blackest Night. Uh, my answer to this is usually Teen Titans, the OG original animated series. Mm -hmm. However, they had a really good crossover with Teen Titans Go!, and that's kind of the best ending that you could hope for for a story like that. I know that movie is fun. It's really I like that movie. good. I liked it's it way better than I thought we would. Really good. Um, I know a lot of people are hoping that we would say Static, uh, Static Shock, which should definitely come back. I'd rather see a brand new Static cartoon. I would rather see a Milestone Universe cartoon. Yeah. Like, give me Rocket and Icon, and yes, they appear in uh, Young, Young Justice. Justice. But let's be honest, they're background characters. They are. They really are. Uh, Rocket gets more to do than Icon. But not by much. But not by much, yeah. Um, but I will say that a lot of the cartoons that I really love have very satisfying ending. Uh, mm -hmm. Gravity Falls has a great final season. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's and, my well, answer. And also, like, the, the question for me is, like, an obvious answer for me would be to say Batman Beyond. But Batman Beyond sort of does get a finale in Justice League. Yes, and you could make the argument if you're somebody who reads the comics that those stories are still being told. Yeah, and there are some really great Batman Beyond comics, actually. So, yeah, um, yeah my answer is still Green Lantern of the Animated Series. And second place would be Wildcats. All right, moving on. You don't mean that. The next question yes, comes from Noah Dalton, who says, I love your anime episodes. Thank you. Uh, what do you think would be the easiest anime for Jason to get into? <laughs> My recommendations would be My Hero Academia, because it's pretty easy to get into and understand. Also, it deals with heroes. Also, my favorite is Yu Yu Hakusho. I think the spirit detective aspect would really draw Jason in. Also, Trigon for a Western aesthetic. Sorry, this question turned into a list of recommendations. How dare you, Noah? It's very no, it's sweet fine. of you, Noah. Um, it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, Trigon. I think I've seen artwork for Trigon. It's a dude. Uh, his name is Vash. He's got like a red coat up to his nose and blonde hair and goggles. Uh, Noah, I will say that is one of the animes that have like every once in a while I've been like, hmm. So this question gets asked to us a lot. And I give Jason a lot of guff about this, but it's not that Jason is not into anime. It's not. It's also that I I, I do not hate anime. No, it's just no, no, no. not my preferred medium. Yes. Um. The thing that I keep threatening to show him, and I think we'll get to when the movie is on the horizon, is Cowboy Bebop. Because okay. I think Cowboy Bebop hits a couple Venn diagrams of things that you really like. Okay. Um, it does have troubling 80s aesthetics of uh, ladies with giant boobies, but All that's right. okay. It's, All right. A lot of our fans recommend My Hero Academia. I know you'll have no problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> recommend My Hero Academia for you, which is hysterical to me. I'm actually watching through My Hero Academia right now, and this is... This comment is not meant in disrespect to anyone who worked on My Hero Academia, but I'm watching the English dub so that I can watch it while I work. 
And I was watching uh, uh, a scene with All Might in it. And Jason came in and was like, that guy sounds like a parody of a superhero. And I just no, thought I think it was I, so funny. I think I said uh, he sounds like a parody of an anime. Yeah, like yeah, it, yeah. It sounded like his voice sounded like the English dub anyway. It sounded like it was one of those comedy skit videos that was making fun of anime. Yeah, because that's not his real voice. That's his like fake superhero mm-hmm. persona voice. Um, so it's funny because everyone recommends that because My Hero Academia is like, what if anime but with Western superheroes? But I don't think it I, would no. be your jam. I, from what I've seen, absolutely not. I think there are characters. I think, it would, it, I think it would throw me away from anime for anime forever. I think there's characters you could really like. Like I, I think I could pick the storyline uh, for anybody who's listening. I would show Jason the hero killer uh, mini arc with Ito in it. Um, when he becomes a genium, that's what I think you would really like. But... I just don't think, I think you need something a little more mature and sophisticated. And yep. My Hero Academia definitely is more of like, an all, it's like a magical girl sort of mm. vibe. Yeah, I won't, I won't dig it. We'll find one that Jason likes eventually and he'll talk about it. But I mean, you speak very passionately when we do Miyazaki. So it's obviously not that you don't like anime. It's 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 the other thing, right? That it's, it's that we have a, a, a strong listenership of anime lovers. Yes. And it's, it's, it's. For lack of a better term, it's that mob mentality of like you must like the thing that we like, and, yeah. it's, and it's like, and it's like no, it's it's not that I don't like it; it's just that I haven't been exposed to it as much as you guys have. Yes, and someday you'll break down and watch Voltron with me, and you'll like Voltron. Sure, yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Alrighty, what's the next question? Uh, Ty Lore, which I don't know if that is a typo or actually this Tyler is really cool. Ty Lore, T Y L O R said. Have you guys been keeping up with the Dawn of X, the X-Men rebranding of the X-Men? Any thoughts so far? I know you guys have stated your opinion on how hard it is to get into X-Men stories right and how they were treated in the modern age. Is this what the X-Men need to be currently, I assume current, and is there hope for a long, consistent run? P.S. I'm quite enjoying it thus far. Is Dawn of X what we're calling post Hoxpox X-Men? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. That is actually what it's branded. Well... Shows what I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm really enjoying Dawn of X so far. I will say that I'm only reading the main X-Men title, and I'm uh, reading Marauders because Kitty Pride and uh, Lockheed, I almost said Lockjaw, and Lockheed are everything. I am reserving my judgment on uh, X of Swords, which some people tell me is is going to be Ten of Swords because it's based on the tarot card. Um, because I'm just not an events person, so I always wait to see what people's opinions are on the events. But I would say that I think this is the best X-Men has been since the first arc of Marvel now, mm. when they first brought the old X-Men to the future. Because um, I really like that, and then I think that really fell apart around the trial of Jean Grey, Battle for the Atom. Um, so I'm really enjoying it so far. I don't... To, the, to your question about is there a, a hope for a long, consistent run... I'm going to be real, real with you, uh, Tyler. I think unless you are reading an independent comic or Batman, I think there is no hope on anything for a long, consistent run, just the way that the current marketplace works and the way that we have seen the big two um, model their series on now. That doesn't mean that it won't happen, um, especially because at least the X-Men book, the main X-Men title is very successful. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's getting a lot of great buzz. But I, I think that is a difficult thing to hope for when uh, big multimedia companies owned by bigger multimedia companies are involved. Um, but Jason, I'd love to hear your opinion because you're the only reason that I'm reading these books. Um, I'm enjoying it so far. Um, I'm only really reading the X-Men book, the mm-hmm. one that's written by Jonathan Hickman. Um, I think so far they're doing okay. We are getting to a point with it that I'm like something else needs to happen because I still feel like we're just – dealing with setup Mm -hmm. um and we're like almost 10 issues in um yeah i i'm excited for x of swords because it involves apocalypse who you love but i'm also cautious of x of swords or 10 of swords whatever you're gonna call it because it seems like it's gonna involve a lot of magic and i'm not that excited about magic with the x-men x-men are science fiction yeah x-men and magic not the character magic, but yes. the, the concept of yeah. magic and sorcery is always difficult for Jason and I. It's not necessarily our preferred mm. thing for them to deal with, which is not to say that it won't be great. Like, I would love nothing more than for it to be an amazing, like, I, knock us on our butts event. I always want a story that I'm uncertain about 
to knock me on my butt. Well, that was how I felt about Hoxpox. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know you about this. You should say what you mean because that is a joke from another podcast. And it's people, not a joke. That's what people call no, it. No, no, no. But you should explain what the hell you're saying. Uh, it's House of X and Powers of X. There you so go. people abbreviate it. Because you ho- might be saying, ho- there was probably somebody in their car being like, what the hell is Hoxpox? You can Google it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, it's House of X, Powers of X, which is the, they're the concurrent mini series that have now been collected into a lovely hardcover and that H- led up to this reboot both written by Jonathan Hickman. Hickman said that he has a five year run and if Marvel lets him do it uh, then there's chances and also with Hickman he's a writer who's very similar to uh, Jeff Lemire and Tom King and Grant Morrison sometimes you can't see what you can't see the forest for the trees until the very end uh, so there is a chance that when I'm going to say when, because I would love for him to get the five years. Yeah. Uh, when five years from now, we're talking about this reboot on the show that we're like, wow, it was amazing. And what it led to was incredible. And those 15 issues of setup really paid off. Sure. I hope so. So I hope so. I think uh, TLDR, we're into it. Next question. Brian J asks, since there have been a few online conversations so far this year in place of in-person events, what are your thoughts on the formats so far? I've really been digging them. I've really been digging them. I like that we have a DC fandom thing. I like that we had a Star Trek day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where's our thing? Marvel. Every brand right now should do that. Should do like this. You, You record them over Zoom. Give them to your fans. Everybody's sitting around doing nothing, and it's a perfect way to create brand awareness and excitement. I, To be honest with you, I hope when in person Comic Cons happen again, I hope virtual Comic Cons don't go away because I like the convenience of them as Mm -hmm. a creator and as a fan. I will say it's been interesting how these, uh, especially the bigger corporate entities have been dealing with this on the back end because fandom only existed for 24 hours. Those panels- Oh, you can't watch them? They're gone. That's stupid. They're gone. I mean, some some people have pirated them. Yeah, Trek- Star Trek uploaded them all to their YouTube channel. Put them on YouTube and they're available on CBS All Access, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is the way to go. Like, why would you you wipe that content? I watched them after Star Trek Day. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I probably would have watched- more fandom stuff. I didn't know they got rid of it because in my head I was I, like, I, I was like, oh, I'll go to it. Caveat, and I'll watch it later. If anyone is screaming at their iPhone, I don't know if they are up on DC Universe. They could be up on DC Universe, but I know that they are not up publicly. Well, that the way that app doesn't exist anymore, actually. Uh, well, it it does, <laughs> but it's being I know, rolled I know. back. Um, DC Infinity, you mean? Is that or what they're? DC, that, it's, in, I think it's like DC Infinite or something. Like whatever. That. HBO Max is great. Um, I will say <laughs> on a. On a much smaller scale, Jason and I have done a couple different events, um, and particularly Mainframe Comic Con, I've really enjoyed doing. It's so yeah, much- our episode from last week was Mainframe Comic Con. Exactly. Um, it's so much less stressful to try and record those, because even though you are given a quote-unquote sound engineer at live events, uh, they're often volunteers, they're often people who are learning the technology. We have tried to record so many live panels that they did wrong, we were not- given the equipment that we were promised, this, that, the other thing. So in terms of us creating content that we can then put in the feed, I've really enjoyed the digital experience. Um, But I do miss seeing everyone and I do miss everyone's incredible stories. And there is something intangible that you don't get, but I think you are absolutely correct. If we can find a happy medium where some of it is digital and some of it is live, I'm, I'm excited for that future. Yeah. Cool. Who's our next question from? Drew Marks, who says, when Milestone reboots, talking about Milestone Comics, of course, what are some aspects you want to see from these stories? Which heroes and villains are you most excited for and hope to see? I will believe Milestone is rebooting when those books hit the shelves because this is the fifth Milestone reboot I've heard about. I, I don't have no idea what number it's on This now. is the one that's happening. I'm not saying I don't want it to happen. This, we've heard, it's like the Deadpool movie. Mm-hmm. We heard about it for so long. And am I interested? Am I invested? Do I think those characters are more important now than ever before? Absolutely. But I will freaking believe it when I see it. Sure. Um, the things that I hope are ported over are, I mean, the amazing characters, and I hope that they continue to deal with uh, real social justice events because that's one of the coolest things that Milestone did in the 90s. I mean, we have uh, a teenage mom, a teenage single mom who's a good mom and a superhero. It tackled a lot of things that 
uh, comics, mainstream comics weren't doing for uh, a demographic that mainstream comics weren't representing. And if that is carried over and the brands are carried over, it's going to be incredible. Do you want to add anything? Um, you know a lot more about Milestone than I do. Yeah, this is, it's, um, I mean, it's a great question. It's, it's hard because it's so broad. Sure. You know, um, I want to see Rocket. Yeah. I want to see Icon. Yeah, I just want it back. That's all I want. Like, I just want it back. Um, I will say this. The images they've shared, I think uh, Icon's new costume design is real bad. I think it looks terrible. I think it looks real bad. Well, that's the great tradition of comics, right? You get a terrible costume, and then we sort of go back to a version of your OG costume. Look, Icon's original costume is great, and I get that he basically has a spawn cape, but, like, who Who cares? cares? Spawn still basically looks like Spawn did in 1992. Spawn also looks like Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to me, because they gave Rocket her exact same costume and yeah. they changed Icon's costume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm kind of with you. I'll believe it when those books come out next year. Yeah. But until then, I, I'm very excited for it. I actually reread Icon this year and guess what? It totally holds up and just stops too. They just cancel the book in the middle of a storyline. That's good because I reread Static. I read Static rather for the first time uh, two years ago and oh boy, do they use words that we don't say anymore. Here is the secret. And of, I'm a very delicate white lady. <laughs> here is the secret of the Milestone universe and what a lot of people that don't have not read the Milestone universe don't realize is that Icon is the best book. Mm-hmm. Icon is actually Static has the most brand recognition because of the cartoon. Because of the cartoon, the cartoon, but the cartoon is not the comic. No, it's not the con- everybody loves Static because of the cartoon. Yeah, but the best Milestone book was always Icon. Interesting. You do love a you do love a Superman take. Well, it's not, it is a Superman take, but it's a Superman, like, it's basically Icon is like, what if Superman landed during the Civil War and was black? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, I, and he just, he's immortal, so he's, well, he's actually an alien, but he lives for 100 years. For as years. far as we understand, yeah. yeah, he's basically immortal. Yeah, and then what if his Robin had a baby? That's God, the book. she's so cool. I just love Rocket she's so great. much. She's great. And uh, she thinks that Static is a punk. Scroll but. scroll all the way. I don't even know what episode it happened in, but all the way back to when Jason taught me about Rocket for the first time on the podcast. Did we? I don't remember what episode that was. I don't either because I don't know what we were talking about, but you like laid out who she was and I was like, that's the coolest thing yeah. I've ever heard. Is it uh, my turn for a question or your turn for a question? I believe it is your turn for a question, uh, but it doesn't matter. Lillian, <coughs> excuse me, Bruxfort says... Do you have a favorite story arc from the Suicide Squad comics? Yes. Continuing on that theme, who are your top five members of the Suicide Squad? You don't have to do five if you don't want to. Five is too many. We're going to we're okay. just pick one. We'll do one. But also pin Lillian. We have had in our queue for a long time a best Suicide Squad ever topic suggestion. That's something that we are thinking about doing. Maybe when the Suicide Squad movie comes out. I doubt we're going to do that. But we might. We might. But so I don't get your hopes up. I'm just saying <laughs> there's a good chance that that will be fully explored at a later time. Lillian, I'm going to answer your first question. Mm-hmm. Do you have a fairy story arc from the Suicide Squad comics? No. I do. I do not. Um, I'm going to say a phrase. Uh, I think there have been great Suicide Squad runs. Um... I think the John Ostrander run that is the original Suicide Squad run is genius. I think it's really great. I think what Tom Taylor did recently is pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think the Suicide Squad are better as supporting characters than having their own book. Like Deadpool, like the Punisher, like Mm -hmm. many of these characters. They work when you, like the Joker, like Harley Harley Quinn. I feel about Harley Quinn, yeah. They work better when you see the character, they get a really good moment, and then they go away. When they have to consistently maintain Mm -hmm. the constructs of a story, to me, the idea loses weight. I agree. Um... I don't think that that Ostrander run has been topped. I agree. And that's Um, the original run. (laughs) It is the original run. It is really cool because we, especially when we are doing these long lived characters, we like to go back and sort of examine their first run and what has translated for that. And if you look at some of the stuff that's coming out about the next Suicide Squad movie, they're actually going back to that. They're making all the characters look like the John Astrander. Yes. And Mm -hmm. they're bringing up some of the weirder characters as opposed to Suicide Squad. The original movie obviously took a lot more from the new 52 incarnation. Well, they were like the characters. They were like, who are, I mean, the only reason why Harley Quinn got in that movie, and yeah. it's and it's a genius movie that they put Harley Quinn in that movie was, Look, and it's an all time great casting choice. Was as because well. Harley Quinn was like 
popping in popularity. Yeah, because of Amanda and Jimmy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Now, I, for me, my favorite Suicide Squad member is I kind of think the OG, the original. Like he is the person I think of when I think about Suicide Squad, and that is Deadshot. Deadshot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be Deadshot. It's Floyd Lawton. Yeah. Yep. There are other characters that I like better than Deadshot, but mm-hmm. that's just because they have been brought into the Suicide Squad from other places. Like, I actually really like uh, every time Ivy shows up on the Suicide Squad. I think that's a really interesting mm-hmm. use of her character. Um, Because I think the Suicide Squad actually perfectly examines the idea of like what an anti-hero is. And I know I'm always like, what's an anti-hero? It's a villain. But this is the idea, right, that you can occupy that like liminal gray space. But I will agree with Jason that it's never got better than the Ostrander run, in my opinion. So go back. The coloring will take you by surprise, but you'll go, you'll get into it after a while. It's a great run. It mostly still holds up. And it's the run that introduces Oracle. That's very true. Oh, one all-time great mm-hmm. disabused DC character. Next question comes from Austin L., who says, would you ever go back and do a redux of an episode from back from the start of Geek History Lesson, like within the first five? Jason? So this is something that we talk about quite a bit um, because we honestly don't know how we would do it mm-hmm. because – Think about it. If we were to release next week's episode is Nightwing, right? And it's the second episode of Nightwing. What would we call it that anybody would that I brand? Because we like the idea that you can be brand new to Geek History Lesson and you can basically listen to every episode. And you can open up your little search tab and you can type in Nightwing Mm -hmm. and then that episode will come up. Or you can type in Robin and the Damian Wayne episode. So I don't know. What we would title it out like mm-hmm. Nightwing 2.0 makes no sense to a new listener. Yeah. Or or I mean, you could call it Nightwing Part 2, sure. Mm-hmm. But then you're automatically telling the listener, oh, I'm not going to listen to that, a brand mm-hmm. new listener. So to me, that is a big problem with me because I do believe, just like comic books, every com- issue of comic books could be somebody's first comic book. Every episode, every episode of your podcast could be somebody's first episode. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to like cut anybody off at the teeth. Yeah. Now, obviously, we've done series, but we always say at the beginning of each of those episodes, like, oh, if you haven't listened to the X, you should probably go back. We also always do them in order. Yeah. We do like Spider-Man um, 1 and 2. So I don't know. I, I also will say that, Austin, um, this is going to happen no time soon because we still have so many. On our fan suggestions, we still have 300 entries. We have almost 400 entries. Which to me, it's like, to me. And discussion topics and yep. book clubs I was, and real life. So for me, I would say that we would have to um, exhaust mm-hmm. that entire list before we ever considered this. Um, right? Do you agree or disagree? Yes. This is a question that we get asked a lot. Yeah. And first of all, thank you for asking because it means you want us to go back and talk about some yeah. of these characters again. Austin, like, what, what is, episode are you wanting a sequel to? That is so <laughs> flattering. It's uh, Winter Soldier and Nightwing are actually two of the ones that people ask us to do the most. But I am actually adamantly against doing this because... Oh, okay. Ashley has put her foot down. I don't want to do this. Um, okay. Every time we discuss doing this, I say, I don't want to do this. And that is because... Even with the characters that we did when we first started this podcast six years ago, that was in the middle of the new 52. That only gives us six more years of continuity. There's not enough. There's just not enough to fill an hour. I would rather take Nightwing, take Loki, take, I, I can't remember who else we did in the beginning, Robocop. And build a discussion around them or build a book club around can them. I, can I Can I give... I'm not saying we'll never do can that. Can I throw out an idea? Absolutely. Instead of us doing a Redux GHL, we have done this before for different characters. What if, if there is a character in our past that you really like or would like us to do an update on? What if we turn that into best... like So let's say it's Nightwing. Best Nightwing stories. or even Yeah, that's what I mean. Or even like... The elements you need in a Nightwing story. Mm-hmm. Like, that would be the thing. Like, oh, yes. if you're thinking about Nightwing, this is the elements you need in Nightwing. And yeah. we sort of, like, talk about it. I would be willing to do that because then we could talk about the new stuff in the history. But you you are correct. It's only been five years. Yeah, like, so for Nightwing, what are we going to do? Be like, his stripe went back to being blue. He knocked up his girlfriend. Well, and, and then, then got his memory wiped. Like, and he, then he got shot in the head and, yeah. and a terrible storyline that nobody likes. Yeah, you know, like there's <laughs> not, it's not as rich a history. And You are correct. Sometimes people give us guff about the stuff that we leave out. 
Uh, Jason and I are building lessons that we're interested in teaching. So you're sort of at the discretion of our taste as well. So I'm not super interested in going back and like retelling you a bunch of crappy subpar Nightwing story or Dick Grayson stories that I left out of or you left out of the original episode. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I get that. So it was a long answer. That's maybe. <laughs> Who's our next question from? Cody. I don't know how to say it. Enos? I always say Enos in my Enos. brain. Cody Enos, E-N-O-S, who I've seen ask us many questions, and I always appreciate them. As someone who wants to make a comic and is writing one right now, all good for you. How can I find an artist when I can't pay extravagantly? I can't do four digits. Ooh, who are you paying four digits for, my friend? Well, I don't know if Cody means four digits per page or four digits overall, because Jason and I don't pay four digits per page. But overall, we pay, like, five digits. Uh, this is a question we get a lot, and, and a this lot is of people ask. A tough me. question. Well, because here, the, here's the honest answer. the The honest answer is, I don't know. Honestly, I have found most of the artists that I've worked with or we worked with, honestly through Twitter. I've seen their art on Twitter, mm-hmm. and I've messaged them and said, "Hey, what's your page rate?" Yeah, that is honestly how I've gotten every comic book artist I've ever worked with. Um, so. You know, I've heard people say deviant art. I've never had any luck on deviant art. I've had some people say Instagram. I have kind of, I have contacted a couple artists through Instagram, but I've always done it through social media. And to be honest with you, um, the price point is the price point is what it is. Yeah, I will say exactly. I will say because um, I've also worked in a publisher in terms of mm-hmm. setting page rates and stuff like that. I only know one creative team where the artist is not being paid and it works and he hits his deadlines and the book that they create is incredible. Mm, But Um, the artist gets all the royalties. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everyone else I know who is a writer, if you don't pay your artist. They never hit their deadlines. I'm going to say something really rude. And if you're an artist, I'm sorry, but artists are lazy. Oh, (laughs) easy, easy. Walk that back. Walk that back. um, Artists don't manage their time well. They will draw your whole book in their last chunk of time because they and and look, I'm not saying that writers are doing any better. But if you are holding if if you hold purse strings, if you have a contract, if you have a page rate, if you have a deadline, then you can make sure and it's for everyone's protection. It's for the writer's protection as well as the artist's protection, as well as the integrity of the book. When you have all those things in place and you are paying them a living wage, which is, yeah, yeah around a hundred dollars at the cheap end, it becomes a job. And that is very different than a thing that you are collaborating on with a friend. If you though have a very restricted budget, figure out what your budget is. You can find someone who will work for $25 a page. You can find someone who work for $50 a page. You can find someone who work for $75. You can also find somebody that will work for free. You, you can, can, but they're harder to wrangle. They're harder to wrangle. They're it's, definitely harder to wrangle. It's all a conversation. And, yeah. um, I will say as well uh, that uh, it is not the official viewpoint of Geek History Lesson that all artists are lazy. Uh, <laughs> we actually just making that comment because as we have found mm-hmm. in our career, nine times out of ten, and it, this is an artist at every level, graphic designer, logo designer, mm-hmm. uh, comic book artists, generally turn in their art the day it's due. At about the, three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, about three o'clock in the morning or the day after it's due. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they will not turn in earlier than that. No, you'll never get um, anything early. And there's nothing wrong with that? Absolutely not. The book happens. Look, and, and If deadlines and, need to be moved, and, it's a conversation. And it's the all art fine. looks amazing. Yeah. Look, they fall down to the page and they add so many lines in the costumes and it looks amazing. When you see the page, you're like, wow, I, you are, you know, um, it is just an observation. Yes. Um, so I would like to personally apologize <laughs> to any artists out there. We did not mean to offend you. That is just our experience so far. Yes. And, uh, you know, please don't all. And it's away. and it's also our experience based on not being giant corporate entities. Right. Like we're independent creators. But yeah, I mean, in terms of this is one of those things about like, what's your advice on writing? How do you find an artist? G- go look for one. And I know that's not helpful. helpful and I know that's not what you want to hear. But um, as a writer, too, you're going to knock on a lot of doors and not get an answer. Yep. But. Most writers, most artists. In most any creative career, you're going to knock on a lot of doors and get no answer. Absolutely. But most artists who are serious about what they do or serious about what they want to do have a website, have an email address, 
and they will answer you. So I would say just be persistent and be willing to do the footwork because that's what you got to do, man. There's uh, unfortunately, there's no magic tool. Okay, I think it's your question. Diego Nunez asks, are there any characters or stories that you initially disliked and flipped to liking or the other way around from liking to disliking? Yes. 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 Jason? Um, I'm looking at his action figure right now. There was a character that in 1992 showed up in the Death of Superman storyline, and I thought he was annoying, and I thought he was stupid, and I hated him. And then a little series called 52 came along, and made me dearly love Booster Gold. And I have Booster loved Gold. Booster Gold ever since. And I have now, I own both the hardcovers of the Dan Jurgens original series. That's how much I love Booster. He has gone from a character that I absolutely hated to a character that I dearly, dearly love. Um, so, and I, and I hated him. I really thought he was annoying the first time I read him. Um, and I, every time he showed up subs- subsequently, I was like, oh, why is this guy here? Um, and it just goes to show you that there are no bad characters. There are just bad writers. Mm-hmm. Um, or bad stories. Yeah. Um, liking to disliking, I don't know. I don't have anybody in the top of my head. Is there anybody that you dislike that you've liked? Uh, that um, you flipped on? I've actually found myself more flipping the other way. Oh, careful. The older I've got, where I liked something initially, and then, you know, our, our morals and our perspectives have changed. And every time you see a female character, they're seen through the ass crack of another female character. I really have a hard time making my peace with that. So what is the story? Um, okay, so when it first came out, I really liked Gotham City Sirens. Oh, interesting. And okay. then I reread Gotham City Sirens last year and was like, I I have to get rid of these. I can't keep these. Um pretends like it is going to be this really empowering story for these three female characters. Um, and then they, and look, the art is, is beautiful. Do you remember who does the art? I don't. We've talked about Gotham City. But it is, uh, it is borderline. I think I've recommended it on the show before. Yeah. It is borderline pornographic. Ooh. Um, Oh boy. Every time a new female character is introduced, another female character, their butt is at the top of the panel, their legs are like, you are, look, it is a crotch shot. It's a panty shot to another female character, usually getting dressed. Okay. Um, All righty then. And and that can be super disappointing. And I'm not necessarily putting that on the creative team because Gotham City Sirens came out 10 years ago at this point. 2008, I think. You know, 12 years ago. It was part of the Batman Reborn, yeah. So... Comics were different. Our morals and our ethics were different. The social climate was different. Art was, di- you know, so I'm not, if anyone likes it and they think I'm nuts, that's okay. It's totally fine. But for me, that's the one most recently that flipped so hard. And the older I get and uh, sort of the more, I don't know, the more of a woman I become, I take issue a lot and I can really like. <laughs> the more of a woman. <laughs> well, I mean, compared to being like a little girl reading comics. I get it. I, get it. Um, yes, I couldn't yes, think yes. of a better way to phrase it. But but even 12 years ago, you were not a little girl. <laughs> I mean, I was not legally an adult. Oh, that's true. All right. Never mind. <laughs> so, Sorry. Sorry. Um, so like I, the, the easiest thing to like get me to turn on a comic is to, is to have the female characters not treated right. And it, that was a book that I, I really loved and some beautiful images have come out of it, but also some like, it's also deeply exploitative in a way that I'm not comfortable with anymore, All unfortunately. Right. Well, there you go. I answered the first part and actually got the second. There you go. Let's Our move on. next question comes from Adam Grunther, who says, who would you say is the scariest character that isn't from a horror movie? Easy. God? God, why did you go to God? God's pretty scary. He'll smite you with like fire. And I stuff. mean, he's pretty scary in AMC's Zeus? creature. Um, Zeus no. will steal your wife. I'm going to give you two. Okay. I'm going to give you two. There's a recent one and there's an old one. Okay. Um, there's a tie for the old one. Mm-hmm. The old one, I think, is a tie between two Sith Lords. I think Darth Maul is a very scary looking character. I think Darth Vader is a yeah. very scary looking character. Now, I know the context of their story changes them, but just from an image based perspective, they are two scary looking dudes. And I've always said since the Phantom Menace that I always felt that they should not have killed Darth Maul or resurrected Darth Maul mm-hmm. for the second of the prequel movies because I've always had the theory that Anakin, before he became Darth Vader, should have killed the monster that perpetrated his nightmares. And he saw Darth Maul when he was like 10. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me that guy with horns and looks like the devil wouldn't stick in his mind. 
Um, now, the most recent scary character, and this is all due um, to the actor's performance, who I'm desperately going to try to look up here really quickly as I vamp. Do, do, it, do. Stop with it. No, that's not <laughs> how you vamp, Ashley. <laughs> Pretty um, sure I'm crushing it right now. <laughs> this is all due. This is a character that I thought was scary in the comics and, you know, powerful and you had to worry about him. But this actor has turned this character into a terrifyingly strange and terrifyingly scary character. And it's all his performance. And I am talking about Homelander from The Boys Mm. as played by also fellow Kiwi Anthony Starr. Mm. Anthony Starr has like elevated Homelander much, much more in a way than the comics ever did. Again, he in the comics, Homelander was kind of like the Hulk. He was just this guy where he like he did scary stuff, he planned scary stuff, but it was one of these things where like he could just kill everybody. But Anthony Starr really makes him psychotic mm-hmm. and really makes it like kind of you know that guy where you can hack off his arms. No. Okay. I know like two things about the boys. So no, that is not the guy. He's basically Superman. He's basically evil Superman. Sure, he's that white guy. He's that blonde guy. Yes, and he wears uh, the American cape. Uh, the American flag is his cape. Mm. Um, but he is, I think, a very scary character. Interesting. Yeah. Who would you say? Um, I think Professor Pig is very scary. Uh. I don't like him. Every uh, Mitch Garrett really likes him. I like Professor. And we'll Pig. like post about him, and I'm like, Mitch, no. Um, I think Mitch he, just loves everything with pigs. I Mitch like Garrett. piggies. Yep. But like little piggies, Miss Piggy. I don't like. Pro- is is Miss Piggy and Professor Pig gonna get married? Find out next next week in DC Comics. He doesn't deserve her. <laughs> also, she's owned by Disney. Um, don't do that to her. But uh, yeah, I think Professor Pig is very scary. I do not like. Um, I also think the Borg from Star Trek are very genuinely scary. I AKA thought, the Cybermen from Doctor Who? Yes. Um, <laughs> I thought they were terrifying when I was a kid. They are very scary in The Next Generation. And even now, when you watch them, like it's just like a dude in like black shirt, black pants with some tubes taped to it's, him it's a it's a black in, in the next generation it was always like a black leotard that they that they glued like yeah piping pl- to like black plumbing yeah to. <laughs> but it's so well executed the idea of it like it's it's a i guess trigger warning it's it's a rape metaphor at every level which is very scary yeah. to me um i think alice krieg as the borg queen is supremely scary she's really good she is amazing especially like corn syrupy stuff they put on her that made her glisten and look, yeah. look real like Wah. like the the shot where she is coming down and her spine is out and they put her in her body uh which was really good sfx for the time it still holds up uh it's very good like that whole sequence except for the Weird chemical fog uh, is very well yeah. done. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always thought that the Borg are really, really scary. Like it is, it's still hard for me sometimes to be like, I'm going to watch a Borg episode. I'm like, oh, yeah? I don't want to. It's why I don't like, I don't like any of the Borglings. I don't like Hugh. Bec- I just, there's something about them that just makes me deeply, deeply Do you like Seven of Nine? I do like Seven of Nine. And okay. I think it's because. Seven of Nine is a great character. They cast uh, basically a bombshell and they were like, we're not going to leave her in this Borg makeup. Like they humanized her very quickly. <laughs> Jerry Ryan is a beautiful woman. She, to this day. I yep. mean, she's stunning. We yep. should all be so lucky. <laughs> but. So it's Borg genes. Yeah. Good Borg. She got all them nanobots keeping her yep. fresh and clean <laughs> and <laughs> sucking the life out of Wesley Crusher and putting it in her. Aging is futile. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, they didn't leave her in that makeup and bodysuit. Like, she looks, honestly, she looks like Rutherford from Lower Decks. She just looks like a cyborg or mm-hmm. a cybernetically enhanced. There's characters on Discovery who look more alien and more robotic than she does. So, yeah, the Borg. They is scary. Jason, is, is the next question me or you? It's me. Nathan McKenzie asks, if you were given the opportunity to pair up a superhero team of five members comprised of two from DC and two from Marvel and one from anywhere else, where would you pick? Now, this is a lot of people. Yeah. So I'm going to say, Ashley, we do this together. Okay. Because it would take forever. Jupiter Jet. Oh, okay. Number one. That's the anywhere else? Yeah. That completely changes all of my answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're on your own, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can start. It's fine. We'll um, do it together. See, this is a hard question, man. This is a really hard question. I mean, this could be an entire lesson. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, boy. I... Um, 
<laughs> All right, we're going to park this away. I'm sorry. I, Nathan, I thought we could answer this, but this is just, this is too much thought. Like, this is going to, because I don't want to just slam people together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I would want there to be character or story reasons or emotionality reasons for these characters to all be on the same team. So, uh, Nathan, we thought we were going to answer it. We're not. This might be a lesson later on. We'll see. Yes. If enough people request it. There you go. All right. Uh, Ashley, uh, Geeks with Shields podcast asks, what are some of your go-to horror movies for this time of year? I don't, I don't have like a go-to, like I don't watch the same horror movies. I don't rewatch horror movies. Mm -hmm. I don't either. If I'm going to be completely honest, um, the, I have a roving phone note of things that I want to watch. And right now I am trying to focus it on some of the spookier stuff because it's at the time of this recording, it's September. So it's basically Halloween. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm usually looking for something with a witch in it or magic. Those are my favorite things. So I just watched it's a 2019 movie, but I just watched The Curse of La Llorona with, um, ooh, what's her name? She's Hawkeye's wife, Linda Cardellini. Uh, is the lead of that. That was a lot of uh, punctuated I, words. I could, I could see her, her name. She was in Freaks and Geeks with Sam. Freaks She's great. And uh, geeks and beep. What? Look, I got Ashley, there. Ashley. I got there. The other end. movies you have. Do you? Uh, the next one on my list to see is Gretel and Hansel with uh, future Jupiter Jet Sophia Lillis. Sorry for that sound effect. I accidentally bumped the board. There you go. Uh, Jason, what about you? Uh, I always say The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. Exorcist is my favorite horror movie Actually, of all time. Actually, this year, uh, considering the, the passing of one of their iconic cast members, would be a great year to watch The Exorcist. Yeah, The Exorcist is, uh, I think, just one of the greatest horror films of all time. Uh, if you think it's silly and cheesy because it's dated, then I think you have uh, bad taste. And you need to always think of a movie in the year that it was made. Within the, within its cultural within its context. context. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also really like Silence of the Lambs as a good horror movie. Mm -hmm. Silence of the Lambs is a pretty freaky movie. If we you watched actually that watch last it. year. And it, and it holds up. It really, really holds up. And it's not it's not super gruesome the way... It's a psychological The thriller. way modern... There's the yeah. one scene where the guy's got his angel wings out, which is kind of... Yeah, uh, but that's... But not compared to a modern movie. Yeah, exactly. It's not really gory at all. No. It's still an R-rated movie, but... Yes. Um, in fact, for me, one of the scariest moments of, of it is just somebody speaking. Yep. Yes. That's all it. right. Those are all of our Patreon questions. So I think we're going to hop over into some of our Twitter questions right now. Great. Take it over. Ashley. The first question comes from at Darth underscore mischief, who says, after 12 years of the MCU, what do you think is being the biggest missed opportunity? A full on Cap and Sharon Carter love story? No. A solo Ruffalo Hulk film? No. Hank Pym being our Ant-Man instead of Scott Lang? No. Jason, what do you think has been the biggest missed opportunity? <laughs> Here it is. War Machine is the biggest missed opportunity of the MCU. And I'm going ding. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there was a little movie called Captain America Civil War, which should have just been called Avengers Civil War. Uh, yeah. And in that movie, there is a pretty amazing scene where the Vision accidentally mm -hmm. shoots War Machine out of the sky. War Machine falls to the ground. And his legs don't work. I, He's, I tear up every yep. time he hits the ground. It's so scary. And it's one of Robert Downey Jr.'s best performances in the entire movie that when he shoots Falcon out. and you can see how upset he is. Now, by the end of the movie, he's still going through physical therapy mm -hmm. or whatever. And, and they also, they kind of ignore this fact that basically Rhodey now has robot legs. Yeah. And they pick it up a little bit in Avengers Endgame, but they don't really lay into it. The biggest missed opportunity, why I say War Machine, is that between Civil War and Avengers Infinity War, we could have had a War Machine solo movie that not only would give representation to veterans, mm -hmm. it would give representation to wounded veterans, and it would give representation to disabled people mm -hmm. you could well, have, and 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 black and people black people as well. but you could have had the very first disabled superhero mm -hmm. movie and it would have been so powerful especially now when there's a huge influx oh, of veterans oh my god it would have been especially him being a black hero would mm -hmm. have been fantastic um especially because like they probably would because you would have came around pretty close to black panther yes um also don Cheadle's a phenomenal don Cheadle's a fantastic actor war machine has had solo books in the past yep. and again 
a disabled superhero is something that has never been done. And I cannot believe it was so obvious and they did <laughs> not do it. It drives me crazy. <laughs> My also, I love War Machine. War Machine is like one of my favorite Marvel characters. My answer to this is always uh, having a woman or a movie led by a person of color in less than 20 movies is the biggest missed opportunity. Yeah, too. Is the biggest travesty. I don't even like this character, but where was my, I'm trying so hard not to swear, where was my Black Widow movie in phase one? Black Widow uh, should have come out right after the Avengers. Or even that, or even Black Widow and Hawkeye. You and I have always talked about that. We couldn't believe that they never did it. They should have just done a team up movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's been it's so funny because mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Perez gave us a lot of great options here for missed opportunity but I was like I don't care about any of these options <laughs> like yeah. those are not things for me that I hang on to if those are other things that people would like to see they're totally valid you're also you're also going to see from us is that um, and a lot of people will disagree with me and please come to, at me on Twitter because you're going to come at me on Twitter no matter what um, the MCU is very homogenized Yes. A lot of the movies, and the next question we're going to get is very is very talking to this, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, a lot of their film follow the exact same pattern. Yeah, it's Iron the Man. Exact, it's <laughs> Iron Man 1, just redux, redux, redux. Yeah. You can almost predict a Marvel movie now to the beat. Which was why you and I were so excited about Doctor Strange well, and Black Panther. Well, Doctor Strange and Black Panther are both they follow that for the beginning and then they kicked it away. Yeah, and it's uh, it actually the Doctor Strange is the magic version of that and Black Panther is the science version yeah. of that. Yeah, and and so like any time that's why I like I that's why I like Infinity War more than Endgame because mm -hmm. it like the villain wins and you're like, "Whoa." Yeah, but it's also a movie, right? Like Endgame. Well, let's not I don't <laughs> even want to open that door because I don't to be honest with you, after 12 years in the MCU, I love the MCU. I'm a little tired of talking about the MCU. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. are better movies out there yeah. <laughs> and I want to talk about them yeah, and I yeah. want to watch them. I don't need to watch Avengers five more times. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I believe that the Avengers will win at the end, whether I watch the movie or not. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm more excited about the MCU doing different stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. That's why Shang-Chi, we talked about this, Shang-Chi yeah. is exciting. That's why Blade is exciting because we haven't what seen... What is Blade going to be? I don't know. Like, how is this... The MCU, the way it's built, it's not really built to handle vampires. Magic, yeah. And, ma and a lot of magic, really. Because um, they kind of hand-waved even Doctor Strange's magic. Well, that, or Thor, for that matter. Yeah, yeah, they got rid. They were like, oh, it's just magic. It's just science you don't understand. And you're like, oh, okay. It's like, but I want it to be magic. <laughs> but to me, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Like, She-Hulk was just announced as a TV show. Yeah. What was the She-Hulk movie in well, 12 years? Well, let's be completely honest. Let's be absolutely, like, cards on the table honest. The DC, uh, the DC, the Disney Plus streaming shows are the ones that they are not sure can carry a movie. Exactly. It is an audition piece. Exactly. For a movie. It is, it is. Because, uh, like, Miss Marvel could have carried her own movie. Um, Absolutely. And it would have exploded, like Black Panther. Moon Knight would have been the same thing. Yep. You are, you are, and I don't even care about Moon Knight, but I know Moon Knight could have carried his own movie. You are exactly right. But I will still go back to War Machine. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Because yeah. not even DC in the comic book. See, here's the thing. War Machine in the comic books. Some people books, might make an argument that Cyborg is a disabled character. That is a very fair point. Uh, but Cyborg has not led his own movie. And I think it's becoming very clear that he will not be leading his own movie. Well, and I'll tell you what, if that's the route that Warner Brothers decides to go and they lean into that uh, as a disabled hero. I mean, also, I, honestly, I'd love it. Also a black man. That's, yep. you know, um, I think that is something that neither universe has done yet. And it's something that I have not seen done yet. Yeah. Where's Oracle? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it would be something really powerful. It would be so powerful, especially, again, being a wounded combat veteran. I agree. Um, and, you know, more ladies. More ladies! Yeah, where do these ladies at? <laughs> uh, okay, next question, Ashley. At Kiefer underscore XJ says, with the hype around Joker 2019, the more or less cookie cutter style of the MCU films and the DC universe still finding its footing, what are some character stories and IPs that could more or less by... I think it's be different. Be different from what the movie going audience would expect from a comic book movie. Well, we were just talking about this, uh, you know, a disabled hero. Um, yeah. Would be something that you would not expect. Uh, I don't really know. This is this is a tough question to answer as well because this is a this is a question that's like, you know, plan a movie studio slate, <laughs> and you're yeah. like, and, and, and I and I don't know how to do that on the spot. I actually think in some ways we need to look at what comic book movies were before comic book movies were cool before the MCU because I would say even before X Men or Spider Man. Interesting. 
Um, I would even give you like that far back. I'm gonna go back to Batman Forever time. Uh, because the year of 1995. And some, some of these happened later, but if you look at Road to Perdition, if mm-hmm. you look at History of Violence, mm-hmm. those are two books based on two movies based on Vertigo series, based on comic books, um, that were treated and executed like Oscar worthy film projects. Mm-hmm. And I think it's in those standalone graphic novels like. Um, first thought, not a perfect thought is like, where's the Capote in Kansas movie adaptation? Like there are these standalone graphic novels that could really function, um, as a big budget drama. And I think that's where we need to go with comic book movies, or we need to be okay with subverting the expectations of the genre. Like I have never seen this movie, but like kick ass is completely the opposite of... I love that movie. I know you do. Of Iron Man, right? And that's why people liked it, because it's not cookie cutter. And I think the more... Also, he's a screw-up. Yes. He's an ultimate screw-up. You're allowed to fail, right? In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you're not going to fail. The most you're going to do is, like, make a fool of yourself at a party. Yeah, for a character named Kick-Ass, I believe he gets his... He gets savagely beaten several times. He gets his ass kicked several times. Yeah, he does get his ass kicked. And and I also think it... You have to open up to... um, some of the YA content that's coming out. And I'm not just saying that because Jason and I write YA, but the most exciting stuff that's coming out of DC right now is DC Kids. Uh, Well, I'm going to say something um, that kind of taps on the beginning of his question, the hype of Joker 2019. And part of the reason why the Joker movie was so successful was one, because the fandom for Jokers and clowns is huge. But second is because they shot it like an Oscar worthy movie with an oscar nominated i don't think he's won who joaquin with an oscar nominated joaquin lead. won the oscar for joker yeah. no but i mean before that had he won before that oh so like when they cast no him, he, he, he was nominated he was nominated for gladiator yeah but they like they picked top quote yep. unquote right because top well, tier talent yes. like they didn't cast a nobody well the and, and the movie is shot beautifully it is a good looking movie mm-hmm. um whatever you think about that movie like that that is where i think you should go and that is something i would like to see from the mcu because you are correct the mcu cinematography is not great no. every movie kind of looks the same yeah um every movie score kind of sounds the same except for the ones that are scored by michael giacchino he's the best um he's the best he's so nice but like and i get that because disney has and the MCU is looking at it as like, we got to fill four movies a year. Pump it out, pump it out, pump it but out. They've also, we, and you know, we're part of that as consumers. Mm-hmm. Like they've proven that the bar, that's where the bar is set. They they can prove they can make a billion dollars yeah. with that. That's what I would like to see. I would like to see more stuff like Logan. I would like to see yes, more stuff. Logan's a great example. Um, like Joker. I would like to see more stuff. Um, I would even put Wonder Woman in that. Sure. I just, I, to be honest with you, I don't need every movie to be connected. I would rather the movie by its singular self be strong and be good. I don't care if it ever gets a sequel Mm -hmm. because if it's good enough, I'll walk out of that movie being like, I don't need the sequel because that movie is good enough. Yeah. And that is something as fans, especially in this gimme, 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 gimme everything at our fingertips on the internet and streaming. That is something that the modern internet consumption culture doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. They always think that more is better. And it's like, no, 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 no. It has never changed throughout human creation of art. Less. Um, it's always quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. And more quantity means less quality. That has never changed ever in human civilization. And so it's so, it's so funny to me that that like we still don't understand that and modern fandom is like give me give me more, give me more, give me more. It's it, it's like the ultimate argument that'll feed into a future podcast with the argument of should HBO's Watchmen have a second season? Yeah. I'm yeah, fervently yeah. against a second season of that show. So am I. <laughs> you know, because why do we need more? The story is done. You know, um, but Jason, I didn't. I don't know if she stepped on the water or not. It, anyway, yeah, it's exactly. It's like pin you, on that. You don't need it. That's not how stories work. Um, and I say this in many places too, where it's the idea of like fans don't know what they want. They yeah. honestly don't know what they want. Um, and anytime a studio kowtows to fans, it's the absolute wrong choice. I mean, yeah, look at Star Wars. Studios, I'll say it right now, <laughs> should should kowtow to creatives with a strong vision 
and leave them alone. That is where we always get the strongest art. Yeah, and it's usually things that you don't think you're going to like. I'll go Mm -hmm. back to, because we've been talking about James Bond a lot this year. Who was excited when Daniel Craig was cast? Nobody. No one. And he's arguably the best or one of the best James Bonds. And Skyfall is arguably one of the best James Bond movies because... Well, Sam Mendes. Well, because they left Sam Mendes alone. They were just like, yeah, just go make a James Bond movie. I mean, DC, here's a free idea. Um, If you want to make a really, really unique superhero story, you have to do either uh, Chinese Superman or Superman Smashes the Clan. Oh, interesting. As movies. Interesting. And treat them seriously and keep them disconnected. Mm. I think they would be incredible. I actually was going to say Two that. Two Gene Yang vehicles. I actually was going to say, <laughs> you know a movie that I think would do really well, but you'd have to have a very strong director and you'd have to leave him alone. Tell me. Him or her alone, actually. Um, or them. Sam and Mystery Theater. Yes, but you would have to leave them alone. So Sam and Mystery Theater is about Wesley Dodds in the 1930s only putting on a gas mask and shooting people. It is a film noir. If you could make a double indemnity, if you don't know that film, go Google it. One of the greatest. Go watch it. It's homework. One of the greatest <laughs> films ever made. Uh, I'm going to put it in our recommended reading. Please do. <laughs> Double Indemnity. It is so good. I believe it's on HBO Max because when I saw it on HBO Max, I was like, well done. Um, make a superhero style film of Double Indemnity. It would murder the box office and it would probably win an Oscar. There you go. Next question comes from at Joel underscore the underscore geek who says, if there was a fictional place you could go visit and go on vacation, to where would it be? Jake? I know the answer to this. Okay. Well, I, I have two. Okay. Number one is Astro City. <laughs> you do love Astro City. Uh, because Astro City is such a nice, vibrant town. Like, you want to go to a metropolis, right? I want to go to that creepy suburb of Astro City. Well, yes. With, so, the, with the dark creatures. Yeah, so you go to their version of... Astro City has everything, right? So, like, it's a nice version of metropolis, right? The Honor Guard is there. You can go to that creepy version of Soho, get your magic powers. You can go hike <laughs> Kirby Mountain yeah, and go see yeah. the, the first family. And most of the superheroes in Astro City are pretty kind. They're not mm-hmm. dark. You have a good shot of not being murdered. Okay. Whereas yeah, you I mean, do, I mean, the confessor is there. Whereas you do in Metropolis. My second choice mm-hmm. would be, and I'd have to find a way to sneak on here. But I'm going to say... Paradise Island? The mascara. Yeah. yeah. I you think could it would, go if your feet didn't touch the ground. I think it would be beautiful. Oh, so if I have like, if I have that like That's hover jetpack, I could like float above it. That's a joke that uh, they do in a lot of like the kids stuff is Diana is carrying Steve and flying the whole time because oh, so your technically, feet can't touch the ground. So technically he's not on the island. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I like that. But I just think it would be beautiful. It and would I think, be beautiful. And Greece is a very pretty place. Yes, I go? assume it is. I've never go? been there. Do you I've live seen in pictures. Greece? Do you have a guest house? All of our Mexican listeners are like, come stay in my house, which is so sweet of you. Ah, uh, We would. We will. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Shire. Duh. It'd oh, be so that easy. makes sense. They would be such nice hosts to you. Um, would you be worried about orcs? Orcs could show up there. Depending on when you're going, the orcs don't... Look, look, look. He didn't say anything about time travel. He the, just said location. The orcs don't <laughs> tend to go that far north. It's actually okay. a big thing that they haven't seen that look, many. A lot of the I dangers assume, of the Third Age haven't touched I them. would assume you're going post the defeat of Sauron. So we're going Fourth Age. We're yep. King Aragorn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would be... I would love, and they would be such good hosts, and the food would be good, and they have cute animals because they're all farmers. Yeah, easy. That I would love to go. Just read a book with Frodo on the river. Like, what? What more could I want? Cool. What more could I want? And last from Twitter is from at Saxman605, who says, who would you like to see as a hero portrayed in a future DC live action film? Oh, well, we've screamed so many options. Jason? Uh, Booster Gold. He's going to stick with that. I mean, I can't. uh, Blue and Gold, I need. I just want Booster Gold. Blue and Gold is the sequel. I want Blue and Gold. I don't think you can do Blue and Gold in in a movie right out the gate. Really? I don't think you can. Nope. Interesting. I think Booster is too complicated. If you do blue and gold, yeah, I think you have to ignore that Booster is a time travel traveler. And to me, that's the most fascinating thing about his character. I disagree. I don't think there's enough room. I don't I think disagree. there's enough room in your movie. Well, well hopefully one yep. day we'll see. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, write it and prove me wrong. Please prove me wrong. I would love to see the movie. I will buy the ticket opening night if there's a blue and gold movie. I just think DC from, can hire me at any time. From a writer's standpoint, I think it's too much. The way I would do it, right, like my first like bad pitch off the top of my mm-hmm. head is you do you do the whole first movie of Blue and Gold as like a heist caper, 
uh, very like Ant Man in that way, like very ground level, not a ton of superpowers. And then you reveal at the end of it that he has time travel powers, and Ted doesn't know. Uh, sure. But I would also make them married. So DC's never going <laughs> to buy my script. I guess I'll just have to write it and change their sure. names. Um, I really think we should see Nubia in an upcoming Wonder Woman movie. I have a feeling we're going to see her in Wonder Woman 84. I hope so. I hope she has uh, big hair and is iconic and at least as tall as Skull is. Um, I, you know, I would have said for a long time of various lanterns, but we know there's a lot of Green Lantern stuff in the works right now. So... Uh, I'm holding my judgment to see if they pick the right lanterns for mm-hmm. that, but that's another one I'm very interested in. I mean, the next one I'm going to say is Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. That's a Marvel book. I don't care. I'm throwing it out there. <laughs> She's so cute. I need to see her on live stream. I cannot believe we don't have an animated Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur that's like for very young kids, like in the vein of Magic School Bus. You know what's crazy? It's even crazier that there's not some sort of Marvel app game that is Moon Girl and Devil that's Dinosaur. That's educational. That's educational. Also, like, lets you play the level where the dinosaur just smashes stuff. Yes. Well, my thought for a long time, because everyone wants Riri to show up in Black Panther as, like, Shuri's intern or Shuri's assistant. Yeah. Um, and I get it, because she's, like, very smart black girl. I think that's really cool. But I want it to be Lunella. And Lunella is... Like one of the smartest people, I think she's the smartest person in the Marvel universe. So I want her to go on a summer program to Wakanda so bad. I have a prediction, Mm -hmm. crazy prediction. I've always thought that they're going to introduce Riri Williams Ironheart in Spider-Man 3. Oh, you used to say that they should introduce her as like Rhodey's niece. I've said that for a long time. Yeah. I still would say that. Actually, to be honest with you, I said for a while that they, if you were to do the War Machine movie, that Riri is his, pops up in that movie. Yeah, I mean, and I'm, then, and then I'm you, honestly down for all of that. And then you do a you do a three movie War Machine trilogy, mm-hmm. and then the, in the last movie, he gives armor to Riri. Yeah, and she becomes the new Iron Man. Um. Also, I mean, I'm just gonna always say Tim Drake. And I saw somebody say on Twitter that Justin Min should play him, which I thought was a really interesting casting. Uh, I don't know that actor. You do. He's do he's been on the Umbrella Academy. Oh, to play Tim Drake? Yeah. Oh, that's a good choice. And I was like, cool. I'd be down for that. You know who? El- <laughs> you know who else I would accept as no. a Tim Drake uh, is the gentleman who plays Five on Umbrella Academy. Oh, Ada Gallagher. <laughs> he would be a he, good Tim Drake. He would be a really. He'd be. A, I'm gonna say something. He'd be a good Damien. <laughs> he might be a little too old to be Damien, but I understand your point. But if they're going to do Damien yep. in a show or in a movie, he's yep. going to be a teenager. Sure. He's not going to be sure, 12, sure, sure. you know? I, I, I actually think either one of them would be Tim Drake, and I look forward to their battling out on Twitter <laughs> for who gets the part. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we have one more question for this episode. This and I comes, think it's an excellent question. This comes from our Facebook. Facebook fans. What the heck, man? Only one? Where is your question? Yeah, only one. So hey, I hey, will, hey, I hey, will, hey, 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 you listening right now. Look, I know we all kind of hate Facebook right now. I'm actually fine if you all want to move over to Twitter. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I get it. But like, if if you're still on Facebook, why don't you go over to facebook.com slash Geek Cash Lawson. Ask us some questions. I mean, don't now because we're not going to answer them. I mean, we won't answer them for a long time. (laughs) Sad trombone. I actually think this question is great. And I think it's a great final question for this episode. Okay. Are you going to read it? Oh, I'm supposed to read it? I read the last one. Uh, Ethan Daniel <laughs> King, who is excellently named, named like a superhero. Yeah, truly. Uh, what is your favorite defining run on a character? Now, the way the question is written, that does kind of sound like, what is the greatest comic book run of all time? Oh, I didn't take it that Oh, way. okay. That's not the way I'm taking yeah. it. I have an answer for this, but actually I want to hear your answer first. So... This is a bit of a tough question for me because there are runs that I dearly love um, where the people who worked on them are not good people or it's come out that they're not good people. And that has colored my feelings about the runs, not about the characters necessarily, um, but it's put me in a position where like I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm happy promoting them. Interesting. Whereas in the past, we have definitely recommended them. Yes. Um. So favorite defining run on a character. I'll give you one for a character that I don't like. Okay. Um, because. You don't have to. <laughs> no, but I, um, I'm going to give you some other ones. But I, I, because Jason and I talk about how there are no bad characters, right? There's only bad stories or yep. there's editorial 
meddling yeah. a lot of the time. Any character can make a good story, even ambush bugs. So I want to take a character that I often say that I think is overused and I don't like and give you an example of what I think is their best run. Okay. Harley Quinn oh boy. is, for me, an exhausting character. I would like her to go away for like 25 years and not come back. I know that that's not going to happen. And I've said on this podcast several times that I would rather park the Joker away and let the Harley take the Joker's place. So it's, I would. I would much rather see I would her rather as her, a full villain. Yeah, I would I rather her be full villain and Batman has to deal with her. I don't. It's the same issue that you brought up with Jason Todd. Yep. I don't like this like half-stepping. Yep. But... Um, when you leave creators alone to work in their bubble, they can do magic. And um, the best, one of the best things that Tom Taylor did, and it's been taken over by other writers as well, is Injustice. Yep. Injustice is... Uh, Brian Buccoletto was the follow-up writer, I Yes. Yep. I wrote an article for DCComics.com about how uh, Injustice might be the best Elseworlds ever told. I think that's a very true story. Boy, did people ever come and fight me on that. We already did Best Elseworlds, right? We did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was yeah. a good episode. It was a good episode. <laughs> but, yeah, because I said The Ultimates. <laughs> and you were like, I didn't even think of The Ultimates. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. <laughs> um, Harley Quinn in Injustice is awesome. Mm -hmm. She is tragic. She is complex. Her romance with the Joker and Ivy really makes sense. Her redemption into becoming... A hero makes sense. Um, so when I think about runs that like really redefined or defined a character for the first time, it always comes to mind for me because I, I'm so tired of Harley, which is not to say she's a bad character. I've just hit my meter with her. And that really presented her to me in a way that I thought was fresh and new and interesting. And Tom Taylor actually did that on another character that I don't really like, Jean Grey. In X-Men Red... I, for the first time, understood, like, what's the deal with Jean Grey? Why do, why do I care about her? Why do people like her? Why should she be alive? And I think that those are, in a lot of ways, greater achievements than me sitting here um, and telling you that, like, uh, Batgirl Year One is a really exceptional Batgirl story because that's something that we all know. That's a character that we all know that I love. So those are two that I wanted to mention. Um, I also want to shout out... Um, the Superman arc right at the beginning of Rebirth uh, with Superman family because Superman's a character that I struggled with a long time. I came to really appreciate after I met Jason and he put the right books in my hand. But for me, that's my Superman is like Superman. Mar it's the same with Spider-Man. I want him to be like married with a kid and a happy life. So I would say post post Rebirth Superman Rebirth volume one. What are some defining runs that you love, Jason? Uh, well, I am going singular because okay. he said, what is your favorite defining run? Well, you know what? I'm greedy. Yes. Um, I am going with, for me, there is no other answer besides the first solo run on Nightwing by Chuck Dixon mm. and Scott McDaniel. It is the first Nightwing ongoing series. He had a mini series before it and a special, I believe. But it's the series that ran for like 130 issues before Batman Reborn canceled it because he became Batman. And then yeah, there was a couple other series after that. But no other Nightwing series has ever, ever captured the quality of the first original run. It's the run where it introduces Bloodhaven mm -hmm. or as the debate uh, is Bloodhaven. It's some Bloodhaven. Um, uh, Mr. Dan Jurgens claims it is Bloodhaven. Uh, well, per the German pronunciation, it should be Bloodhaven. So, but um, but anyways, uh, it's the first time that town was introduced. Nightwing has to go there, and he has no support. He has no Batman, nobody else, and he can't depend on the cops because the cops are just as corrupt as the criminals. And it introduces uh, who I think is one of um, Nightwing's greatest rogues, Blockbuster. Mm-hmm who was an old Batman villain that they retconned and made him smarter and better and whatever. Um, and literally bigger. It is the run that made me love Nightwing. And I think it is the run that if you are ever like, ah, I didn't like Nightwing or I don't like a Robin, I would, I would vastly, uh, or excuse me, I would highly, highly, excuse me, highly suggest you read that run. And it's all collected in soft covers. Now mm -hmm. the entire, they finally collected the entirety of the Chuck Dixon run and uh, they keep going on. Uh, Devin Grayson follows that run up. So does Peter J. Tomasi. It's a great Devin Grayson's work on that run, I think, is underrated. That series from start to finish is solid. Mm -hmm. It is such a good series. It's never been completely collected, and I'm hoping that eventually they get around to it. Now, if I were able to say a second place, <laughs> I would say Judd Winnick's run on Green Arrow. 
I thought about that. I also thought about Mark Waite's Flash. Mark Waite's Flash. Or Impulse. I mean, I would also argue that Ron Mars's Green Lantern Kyle Rayner run is pretty solid. I mean, I think it's between, and it's your taste in lanterns, mm-hmm. right? It's between Ron Mars and obviously uh, Jeff Johns. Jeff Reaper. Johns, Hal Jordan yeah. is pretty de- character defining as well. Um, but for me, I always think of that Nightwing run. When I think about um, a character and like how a run defines that character, mm-hmm. that is the run I always think about. Yeah. Also, that era of Batman is like our personal favorite. It's the best. <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Um, by the way, um, if you've enjoyed any of our thoughts about comic books and all this other rigmarole, uh, I would suggest you to go check out some of our books over at www.jasoninman.com slash store, where you can buy signed copies of Jupiter Jet, the Ringo nominated Science, the Elements of Dark Energy. Please and vote for it if you are presser pro. And... Um, and super soldiers, super soldiers. Um, sorry, you really knocked me off my my, sorry. Uh, my soapbox <laughs> there. Uh, a salute to the comic book heroes and villains who fought for the country. My nonfiction book about the secret connection between the military. All the copies are signed, and we uh, always throw in little extra swag and stickers and bookmarks. You never know what you're gonna get. I will say, if, if people really liked um, Jason's impassioned speed about Rhodey as the person who got to read every incarnation of super soldiers, the James road chapter of super soldiers is one of the best ones. Oh, it's thank you. so good. I like Rhodey a lot. He's great. All right. Let's, uh, let's move into recommended reading. Uh, that of course is where you go over to our website at geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. You can find everything we suggest. I think, uh, this is just going to be a hodgepodge of stuff we talked about this. Yeah. Week. We're going to grab some stuff like double indemnity, Astro city, nightwing volume one, injustice, X-Men red, a lot of the stuff that we mentioned, I'm going to remember to put over there. <laughs> cool. And now we're going to go into the honor roll. Yes. Ashley, what's that? The honor roll is where if you go to Apple Podcasts or in my computer, as it's still called iTunes, and you leave us a five-star review, we will read whatever you write. And we have, if you are an international Mind University student, take a screenshot of your review, email it to geekhistorylesson at gmail.com so we can share it. We don't have access to your Apple podcast, but we love and appreciate you. We ask you to do this every podcast because you doing this means we get bumped in the algorithm. More cool people can find us and you're just helping us continue to do more discussions, continue to make more geek history lessons and uh, just live our best podcast life. So we have two people joining the honor roll today. First is Dave G7777, who says, as an old school comic book geek, um, I mean fan, I love listening to Ashley and Jason discuss graphic novel characters and stories from all eras from the golden age to the present. These two hosts have great chemistry together and their discussions are both insightful and hilarious. I especially love Jason's three sentence explanation of Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> Highly recommended for any graphic novel novel fan there's your applause your quick three second applause or actually probably one second applause uh they are also joined by kelvin too who says fun banter and info great listen and enjoy the rapport between the two hosts as a near deaf individual i am very grateful for the clear strong voices of the hosts neither of whom i have difficulty understanding kelvin that's so sweet that's very nice. I'm glad you can hear the podcast. I'm also glad that us being uh, loudmouths has paid off in a really helpful way to our listeners. I love that. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so Dave G777 and Kelvin to welcome into the Teacher's Lounge. Professor Jason, what is going on here today? Over in the corner, Mr. Morita. Has some lemon snaps over in the corner. He made a little plate. What does uh, Mr. Marita teach? Gym. It's a Karate Kid reference. I am aware. He teaches gym. Marita. He teaches gym. I know. And slash waxing. Slash catching flies. Waxing on and waxing off. Well, waxing on is waxing one on one. Waxing off is waxing. Don't forget to go over to <laughs> Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five star review if you want to join them in the honor roll. Also, do not forget. To check out our Patreon to support the podcast, patreon.com slash job. And there are five exclusive podcasts, possibly a Just League podcast coming soon, and other things if you go over there and support us at patreon.com slash job. It really helps us out. Also, don't forget to follow this podcast on social media. Ashley, where can they do that? You can do that at geekhistorylesson.com, facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson, or 
on Twitter at GHL Podcast. There is a ton of way to contact us in all of those places. We're always running hashtag campaigns. Go check those out. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. Follow Ashley on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. Robinson. And now we're here to hashtag stick around. We did not plan this before the episode, Ashley. Mm. What the hell should we talk about at hashtag stick around? What is a question? Oh, by the way, I want to, I can't remember who posted about this recently, but somebody posted about how they love that I hashtag stick around. And I wish, I think I shared it. I wish, um, we're going to doom scroll. All right, all right hold on, it. hold on a second. All right, everybody, we're going to talk here. We're going to both get on the internet <laughs> and, and we're going to try to see if we can find this person. It might've been Nathan McKenzie. You know, uh, one of these, somebody like I was, I, it I, was a recent tweet. It was very recent. And they were like, you have to do hashtag stick around because we always do some real nonsense at hashtag. My, uh, my mobile Twitter app is just not working. Well, I am scrolling. Did you find scrolling, a hashtag stick Scrolling. I am scrolling. Me too. Do, 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 do. Going through my mentions. This is great podcast. This is such amazing podcasting. I am sure nobody has ever done anything more entertaining than we are doing right now. Jupiter Jet. Okay, this we need to we need to move on. This is getting real boring for the listeners. I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, okay, um, so hashtag stick around. Um, I I can find okay Brock Severson at Brockaby. No, that's from 2019. He said, I always stick around until the end of the episode. Well, thank you, Brock, even though that's a year old. That's not who we were talking about. It's Nathan McKenzie. I was right. Just remember when you listen to each and every episode to hashtag stick around and listen to some extra content Jawan and Ashley B. Robinson have. And Nathan asked a question today. He did? In our, what segment was it? Uh, in our Patreon, he asked the question of, uh, he asked us to build the super team that we couldn't do. Oh, yes. So shout was, out to Nathan. Apologize. You're lovely. It's way we too, adore you. Way too complicated. Um, I had an idea for hashtag stick around. Please. What is a question or what is a topic that you're surprised people don't ask us about? Because we- That is such a difficult question. Well, actually. we get, I'm, I mean, just to be honest, <laughs> we get a lot of repeat questions. We do. For mailbags, um, and we get a lot of the repeat questions on lives, and we got a, we get a lot of repeat question um, for Patreons um, when we do lenses. We use the lens feature for Jason to do a lot of like quick answers. Um, and I will be completely honest; I'm always surprised people don't ask us more personal questions. <laughs> Every once in a while, we'll get someone being like, "How are you doing? How is your family? How is intern Brago?" Um, but we get like overwhelmingly more people asking us about Batman than anything about us. And I'm always surprised. I'm not saying that you have to. I'm just saying that I am surprised by that. I will say I don't mind it. But the question that we get the most is what comic book character do you think should be in a movie? Yeah. Or a TV show. Or a TV show. And I think we've gotten that question. You did a whole podcast about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think we've gotten that question every mailbag. Yes. Every mailbag. Um, and it's not that we don't have opinions and it's not that we're not well, absolutely we, flattered. No, we that answered people it. We answered it this opinions. week. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's the one that comes up the most. Um, it's usually. What personal one do you want to. What, what, what do you. Okay. Because you put that out there, Ashley, I now have to ask you a personal question. You don't have to ask oh, me. I'm just happen. surprised that people don't ask us more personal questions. I'm gonna, That's all. I'm going to Google right now. Because we always say, like, you can ask us anything because, uh, as we say at the beginning of each mailbag, it's our discretion what we I'm answer. I'm actually surprised I don't get more writing questions. Yeah. Would you like to get more writing questions? I would. I would love to get, answer more and, questions. And by writing questions, you mean. Not pitch me a flash movie. You no, because like, I'm not doing that. You mean process questions? Yeah, I mean inspiration like, questions. I would love to be like, yeah, people to be like, well, who do you think like has a successful character arc in a superhero movie, or what villains do you think actually work, or what are what, tropes that you like to? What use? tropes do you like? What tropes do you hate? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like what is the most overused Superman trope, or what is the most overused Batman trope, or like what do you think is necessary for a great Batman mm -hmm. story? Like what elements? Yeah, how I, do you write for an artist? Because that's where you get to like real interesting conversations. Whereas, uh, you know, like other questions, like you just stay surface all the time, mm -hmm. and, and it and it just is not as interesting. There so, you go. Um, okay, Ashley, um, I just went to personal questions to ask people. <laughs> and I'm going to give you this okay. question. Question number 17 from this weird website. I'm pulling it. What small things make you happy? Uh, Jason at John went on Twitter <laughs> at GHL podcast. 
What small things make you happy, Ashley? Uh, small things that make me happy. I'm not a very happy person. I know one small thing that makes you happy. <laughs> Brego? Mr. Uh, GHL intern Brego. Who, yes. I don't know. He didn't even show up for work today, guys. He could be behind the sound blanket. I don't think uh, he is. To be fair. Here's something that makes me like. He is not in this room. Inordinately. He did not show up for work. He's fired. We don't pay him. Here's something that makes me inordinately happy. Uh, I have a hummingbird feeder and we have a hummingbird hen who comes to the feeder every day. And whenever I see her, I saw her once doing a live and fully abandoned the live to go look at her out the window. She makes me really happy. If you had a plane ticket, where would you like to go? Free plane ticket anywhere in the world. Assuming there's no COVID? Yeah, let's say COVID <laughs> is fine and we're all good. Uh, New Zealand. Ah. Easy peasy. Aside from the job you have now, what sort of work would you like to do? It's pretty obvious. Uh, I'm doing all the things I really want to do right now. I mean, but are you the lead of a television show? No, I'm going to be the lead of a television show that Jason go. is a showrunner on. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Depends on how good your audition is. No, <laughs> no, you know, you know what? That's a, that's an absolutely fair statement. Yep. Um, <laughs> or Lamont McGee. I'd love to be on. I would lo well, look, I would love to hire you. I may not have that choice with the studio. No, I'm know, just, I'm, know, I'm, I'm, I'm front loading <laughs> the apology right now. It's fine. Um, I don't want to run Warner Brothers. So, uh, actually I only want a yes or no answer to this. Okay. Do you have a deep, dark secret? From who? That's all the question has. Do you have a deep? There's, I, 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 I'm looking for a yes or no. I'll say no. Huh? Okay. Ashley, what do you keep under your bed? My cat. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> uh, our under bed is uh, it's storage, so close. Let's have you ever won an award? <laughs> yes. What was it? Many awards. What was the award? Um, I won an award for high merit in acting. Uh, in the Sears Drama Festival, which is the high school drama festival in uh, in Canada, in Ontario. Uh, I won an Ontario Scholar Award, which means I was an elite student. Um, I graduated magna cum laude. I've won a ton of awards, but like all of them are meaningless, you know. Those are all your personal questions? Well, I'm just This is making it starkly uh, obvious to me why I don't want to do the Ashley Geek History lesson. Well, here you go. <laughs> uh... Let's see here. I'm just trying to find ones that I think are good because some of these are not that great. I know. Those um, are like, it's like questions to ask on a first date mm -hmm. and it should just say, be a human. <laughs> like, I mean, one of them is, do you ever feel pressured by your friends to fit in? And you're just like, that's dumb. Uh, I will say I don't. And I'm not friends with people who I feel don't like me. I will, <laughs> there's a, there's a Aries meme that's like, I will unfriend, uncousin, unfamily you so fast. And I, I feel that deep in my heart. I think this is a great ender question. Sure. How do you want to retire? I don't want to retire. Ever? Do you want to be like Colm Fior and still be like, uh, like in your sixties yes. and uh, showing up in Netflix shows? Absolutely. That like, to me, that's a dream. Where would you want to live? If I could live anywhere, no, I'm not looking for a specific location. I'm just like, what kind of atmosphere do you think you like? Do you think you'll retire in a city? Do you think you'll retire in the country? Um, I like cities. Okay, I like cities. Mm -hmm. I like escaping to the countryside, but I like cities. If I could live anywhere, and and get the call and get like flown to L.A. or New York or Toronto or wherever to work, um, I'd love to live in Scotland. Cool. So sweet. Do you, when do you want, when do you want to retire? Do oh, well, you want this, to retire? This is not about my stick around. Uh, this is about Ashley, Victoria, Robin, stick around. And that is it for this podcast. Such a butt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your amazing questions in this extra long Geek History lesson. I am Jason. No personal questions for me. Oh and my then. God. I'm Ashley, Victoria, Robinson and professor. I'm not personal. Uh, do we please dismiss the class? I will say, I'll put it out right here. We don't know what we're doing for the GHL Extra. I will literally hand you this iPad. You could ask me these same questions if you I, want to make that. For I wonder if we did like 200 questions. Remember on Jason and Ashley? Did we? Yeah. And like at the beginning of last year. And do you think these are the ones? I wonder if these are the same questions. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Class is dismissed.